five minutes worth. Yeah, so a lot of time we do um, webinar simul uh, casts occasionally, um, and we do tend to have um, people in both places. So it's not uncommon for everyone to be tweeting and to be on the on the webinar. Okay, so Paul just um, posted the uh, summary of responses for the first question. So you'll see that show up. Paul's our moderator today, um, and uh, so what he does as moderator then is he just kind of creates this summary of everything that's um, all the responses that have been tweeted out um, and then that's Kevin's cue to go on to the next question um, so now Kevin's uh, posted question two um, should cooperative extension have a role in trying to communicate with those that harbor less than scientific views he's making us think today and <laughs> think really this hard seems like the, the question of the century because we have some people who say nope we're staying out of it and we have other people saying that we have an obligation to do this, it's the work that we were hired to do. Mm -hmm. But who wants to have a, a slew of personal attacks against them, which is what has happened in Kevin's mm -hmm. case because of the the work that they were hired to do. It it's a very hard it's a very hard question to answer, and that's why we need to come up with with better ways of, of communicating some of these things and creating communities that are really going to be open to hearing information. So, so what are your what are your responses and answers to that question for everyone that's here on the webinar? How would you answer that? I'll try to watch the uh, the Twitter feed too and see if I I notice anyone that's on the webinar that's posting things out, so you don't have to answer in two different places. I think Eric kind of Eric Staffney from Mississippi State. I just um, I saw him tweet his answer. I think he agrees with Danae. It's like if we don't do it who's going to do it because that really is our role as extension professionals is to get the evidence-based information out to folks. Mm -hmm. I think part of the problem too, especially with social media is there are so many people using social media and seeing bad information because bad information is very easy to find. Good scientific information isn't as easy to find. So when people see all of this bad information, they're going to start to believe it because that is literally the only thing that they're seeing. So then when the one person like Kevin comes in and says, whoa, 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 like this is not right. Are you going to believe these hundreds of thousands of people who are all believing this pocket of information? Or are you going to believe the one university researcher who's saying, nope, that's, that's not right. So we need to have, in my opinion, we need to have a bigger presence, but it can't just be one person. It has to be, it has to be a group effort. It seems like a lot of people agree with that. A lot of people on the, the tweet up are saying, yes, it, it is our role. Mm -hmm. And and one, a conversation that we've had um, frequently uh, during tweet ups and outside of tweet, tweet ups is, you know, how do we, um, how do we improve our communication methods and our engagement methods then? If we're, if we know that it's our role, um, obviously there is a large segment um, out there that is, increasingly anti-science um, and how do we reach out to those folks or how do we get the information out in the first place you know personally I feel that um, part of the reason why we have such um, a large portion of the population that feels that way and is leaning that way now is because extension has not been prominent um, and has not done a great job in getting that research-based information out the way that people want it and where they want it, you know, where they're located and in the spaces that they're in, so social media and otherwise. Um, and so that makes it even harder for us to, to do our jobs now um, when we're getting some pushback uh, against that information. So, and Jenny, you're absolutely right. It is a group effort. Yeah, and to go along with what Jamie said, we have a lot of people who per surveys and, and research that we've done within Extension who say that we are consistently like five to seven years behind on important topics. If we can find a way to change that and we are, instead of being five years behind, we're at, at the cusp of that new information, would that change people's attitudes? Instead of you know hearing five years of bad information, Extension's up front at the cusp saying, no, here's the real information you need to know. I think we could really change people's attitudes on some of these controversial topics. So we also need ways to identify what those upcoming topics are going to be and how we can address them before they get really out of hand. So it looks like, um, three. yeah, some folks are on question three. I think Kevin went ahead and tweeted out question three before we got the summary of question two. 
Um, this is first time hosting, so <laughs> there's going to be some some hiccups. Um, so uh, question three is, let me scroll back up. Um, do do we? Oh, so we see so we see this need to deal with controversial topics, but how does your university or state feel with you being a lightning rod? So basically, um, how does your university or your organization? Feel about you um, talking about these controversial topics or trying to help um, you know share um, research-based information that relate to these controversial topics do they want you to be involved in it do they support you um, do you just kind of do it anyway and hope that they support you um, so you can put your responses to that uh, in the in the group chat if you want to And I would be interested, like here in Ohio, I'd be interested to see what our administrators say versus what our educators say. Because I think our educators have this, they don't want to be the ones putting themselves out there. But I would love to sit down with some of our administrators and, and just ask them, you know, how, what do you feel like if our educators start to place themselves in the, the spotlight on some of these topics? I don't know what they would say. I don't know, Jamie, if you have any sense of, of what they might say. Uh, it depends. It depends on who your administrator is and how they feel about social media and new methods of communication in general. Um, it really does. If they are, if someone, if they're someone that's comfortable with social media and understands the dynamics um, and the groups and you know the populations and the audiences that are out there um, and why information spreads um, online the way that it does now, um, then they're probably going to be pretty supportive and give you some. You know, I don't want to say guidelines, but just give you, uh, you know, some information on, you know, here's how you can address it. This, this, these are some examples of cases that we've had. But really, in extension, we've stayed away from those topics so much that there aren't any really good examples of here's how I dealt with it, mm -hmm. other than maybe in little niche areas and in teams where they've just shared it amongst their, their, you know, um, their internal colleagues and the people that they work closely with. Mm -hmm. So it's something that we really need to have, to pull more of together is having these examples of, you know, I've dealt with internet trolls or I've dealt with um, difficult volunteers online and, and this is what happened. This is how I handled it. It's something that's really lacking right now in extension. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people saying as long as the science is factual, as long as what you're presenting is, is truthful and as research based as possible, then your administrators should support. I wonder though if, if the answer to that question becomes different because like in Kevin's case in particular, his university had to do a lot of, of work because they were receiving phone calls. I'm sure they were receiving lots of phone calls and lots of letters um, and communication from the advocates who are saying, you need to fire this man because of the work that he's doing. So from an administrative standpoint, does your answer then change if you've experienced something like that? I mean, obviously University of Florida, I think has done a good job in supporting Kevin. Um, he was absent on social media for a, a short time there, I think last fall. Um, but he's gotten right back on social media and he's been able to um, continue um, his work in, in biotechnology and, and information and outreach. Obviously, administration in his university probably played a large role in navigating him through, through those couple of months and you know, gave recommendations on what he should do. Kevin said that um, a lot of the political leaders in his state in Florida don't believe in climate change or sea level rise, <laughs> which is unbelievable for some place like Florida. It's just unbelievable to me that that happens. <laughs> a state that has a lot to lose. Mm -hmm. So how many um, on the webinar, and I recognize several folks, but how, are, is there anyone on the webinar that is not, like you do not have an extension appointment? Like maybe your, your faculty at a university um, and you don't work directly with extension? I think most do. So Jenny, oh, so great. Model of extension as a farmer, that's great. Yeah. Citizen volunteer, that's wonderful. Glad you guys are joining us today. A farmer and a brand manager. <laughs> so Jenny, I'm ex I'm I'm curious as a farmer, how do you um, when you have uh, folks online or in person approach you about 
you know, things that aren't research-based, how do you, um, how have you handled that in the past or have you had to deal with that? That's a, that's a great point. That's a great point, Jenny. And if you want, if you want the person that you're talking to um, or sharing information with online to listen to you, then you have to be willing to listen to them too. That's a great, great point. Mm -hmm. Listening is, is so important. And you know, when I heard Kevin keynote at a conference in Florida earlier this summer, I mentioned, and a lot of what he was saying is that it, it is so important to listen to people and to understand where their fears are based. He said a lot of the, the people that he's experienced in these anti-GMO advocacy groups, a lot of them are moms wanting to do best for their family. And because they see this really bad, scary information about GMOs, like GMOs cause cancer, GMOs cause illness, they're seeing that over and over and over on social media. What option do they have other than to believe it and start to advocate against it because they don't want their kids to get sick because of the food that they're eating. It's a really scary thing. So if you can get to the base of why they're afraid and you can open up the conversation from there, I think it, it produces a much better outlet for a, a change in attitude and knowledge than it does to just say, well, you're wrong and you need to do better at understanding science. That's not a, a good way to go about it, obviously. So now we have question four. Uh, what is your state's stance on dealing with controversial topics online and do we need guidance? So do you wish that your state would give you guidance um, and suggestions for how to deal with things online when there are issues? I know that in Ohio, we've, we've had people you know, lament that we, d we don't necessarily even have great detailed um, guidelines on how to appropriately use social media. Um, so we've got recommendations, but they're mostly common sense. And, and a lot of times people want something more than that. They want more details and, and examples. Um, and that has, that really doesn't even tap into, you know, dealing with controversy online. The tweet that I'm sending out right now is that in Ohio, it seems like most of our educators and most of the, the policies regarding, um, the work that we do, it, it really revolves around social media use in terms of just marketing. Most of our educators are using it just to send out program information, not as a tool for actually educating people. So we're not doing a lot of, we're not creating a lot of content that truly has educational value on its own. It's mostly, hey, come to this in-person program. Um, so I, I think we definitely need guidance. Somebody said guidance or strategy. I think we need both. <laughs> I think we need to come up with that, that strategy. And then I think we need people in place like Jamie or I at Ohio who can provide that guidance for really using, um, really using the internet to leverage your, your communication methods with audiences who are only, might only come to you via online. They might never come to an in-person program. Yeah, John was, um, John mentioned first amendment issues, um, may come into play from an HR standpoint. Um, that's a good point. A lot of times our hands are tied when it comes to how, you know, how do we respond and what can we say? It's so hard. I always forget how hard it is um, to participate in the tweet up and host a webinar at the same time. It is always so difficult. <laughs> Yeah, Jenny mentioned funding as a, an issue. That's definitely an issue. I'm not worrying about funding being um, pulled. I think we have some funding questions coming too. Um, those will be interesting to see how people respond to that. There's a lot of misinformation about how research gets funded and that, that opens up a whole other <laughs> topic area of, of controversy within the university system, at least from um, you know, the, the public's perspective. And Jenny had a great point about, um, you know, a lot of folks in extension are constantly worried about funding being pulled from, from them. Um, and so that might be one reason why a lot of folks are 
um, timid and try to shy away from getting involved in controversial topics and talking about stuff like GMOs and everything online. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and, and you have the discretion of like your county, your county commissioners or county council. Mm-hmm. You don't want to make people bad. <laughs> And Paul pointed out that most of his colleagues are shocked when they see that um, he's in, even engaged in a controversial thread or a discussion um, because they're, you know, that is kind of the reaction. And I wonder how new extension employees, how they might react when, when they get that kind of feedback from their more seasoned colleagues, because I think that might make them less likely to, um, to do that again, um, because they might think, oh, maybe I shouldn't be, um, talking to, to this group or engaging in this conversation. You'll see Kevin said that a lot of the faculty at his university, so his colleagues are saying that he's wasting his time. I'm assuming he means with regard to education and outreach, and he should focus on more administrative things and the research that he does. Kevin is primarily a researcher. He's, you know, that's what he does. And he has chosen to, to go the um, education and outreach route because he feels like it's such an important, an important topic. Scott asked a great question. What would you accomplish if you weren't afraid? <laughs> Probably a lot. <laughs> That's a really, really good question. Yep. And um, I'm Mem Somerville. <laughs> I'm not sure who that is, um, but they had a great point. Um, it makes it seem like there's no response from the universities, like the LGUs, the land grant universities, and extension when we completely stay out of the conversation. And again, that allows the misinformation to proliferate, um, in my opinion. Um, so it's, it's, it's hard to know, you know, it's hard to know what to do. And I, feel, I do feel like administrators and directors, um, if they could get on the same page and uh, send out information as to what, you know, some guidance as to how they want their um, extension staffers and educators to handle these kinds of topics, I think it would really help. Oh, that's you. Well, that was a great point, Jenny. Good job. <laughs> I'm just looking through the tweets, see if there's anything else we should share. There's a lot of really good, good information, good opinions coming out. So Paul's summary is that the consensus is that we need more training. And I, I definitely think that that's true. I think that we need training from the administrative perspective, from what that means um, for your university and, and the university's image. If you have staff who are engaging in these controversial topics, then I think that we need some real dedicated training to the, the educators who are going to be offering that and what's, what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. So Kevin um, put out question number five. I talked a little bit about um, the Freedom of Information Act earlier and how that was used against Kevin to get access to his emails and create this really false narrative around the work that he does. So he asked, do you think that the Freedom of Information Act is helpful to earn public trust in controversial areas? Is it being abused? Karen, that is a great point about Chipotle. People were very um, upset about, you know, Chipotle's huge campaign for, well, we're not using GMOs anymore, and people were just thrilled. Like, people were so excited to hear that. It's just like when, um, was it, I think Cheerios started to put on their box that they, they don't use GMOs, and Cheerios are oats. There are no GMO oats. So Cheerios have never been made with GMOs. But all of a sudden, they start putting that on their, their box, and people are thrilled with them as a company. <laughs> like, you can't even use GMOs in, in your product. But they're, they're marketing. I mean, they're, they're smart in terms of marketing, but it, it's just bringing society down in terms of our scientific literacy. I loved, um, I think Eric, I think you're here on the webinar. I loved your, your tweet about um, Kevin's outreach doing more to advance ag than any single research, research program is likely to do. Um, that's a great point. I mean, 
extension is built on forming relationships with folks and that's that's our niche that's what we do we can engage we can form relationships and that builds trust um, and that's what we need if we want to turn the tide on you know misinformation leading the way on social media That's a really good point. Yeah, that scientists are not marketers, but that's who we're, we're jousting with. It's not the same playing field. Yeah. In a lot of ways, and, and I think this is where some of the, the, the controversy maybe is not the right word comes into play, is that scientists, some scientists are not really trained to be communicators. And a lot of people who are communicating information aren't trained in science. So that's why we see a ton of information happening out there because the scientists are like, well, we're not trained in, you know, providing education, even though we're the lab folks who know what the science says because we're the ones doing the research. Um, so instead we have these, these big personality people like Food Babe who can create this huge following around a, a specific topic and just get people on board with them. And then they have, you know, celebrities who can get on board with them and, and advocate for the work that they're doing. And it, it just kind of, it, it opens up this whole, um, you know, th this whole group of, of people who are now the Food Babe Army and others like them. Yeah, it would be interesting to know if we, if, if every land grant university um, that had an extension organization or system created this just powerhouse of a communications department, you know, where would we, where would we be in like 10 years if we could do that now? Um, I think we'd be telling a different story. I really do. Um, because it's like everyone has the skeleton crew of a communications department and the communicators will, will say this and, and they're very frustrated by it. Um, and uh, it would be great if we could have the support and, you know, the marketing capacity um, mm -hmm. to take on some of these, yeah, some of these other, <laughs> the, like the people that really um, send out those massive marketing campaigns. And yeah, when is extension going to stop being every state's best kept secret? Everybody has said that since the day I started an extension and why are we a secret? <laughs> like why don't people know that they can come to us for scientific information? And if we were better at, at marketing ourselves, we could do a lot. Well, and it's not, it's not simply um, marketing ourselves, but it's also marketing the information that we have in a way that people will, will use it and want to keep mm -hmm. coming back for it. Um, and uh, like I said before, forming relationships and building trust is an excellent way to do that. Mm -hmm. We are good at that. We're just not good at getting the word out. Mm -hmm. And yeah, GMOs is a hard one in particular. I've shared this with Jamie before and others in, in my state. I used to be a Master Gardener volunteer coordinator. I was friends with a lot of my Master Gardeners on Facebook. They built up this image for themselves as being a Master Gardener volunteer. So people knew that they were a trusted source of horticultural information. And then they would go and they would post stuff about, you know, how organics are, are inherently better than non-organic and that GMOs are super bad. And I'm like, you of all people who have been trained in this information should know not to, to say something like that. Like you're a Master Gardener volunteer. And then another issue becomes how do you, how do you balance that? Like they're, they're a volunteer, so you can't really hire them. You can't really monitor their social media use in any official way. So it's another, another topic. Kevin did just post question number six. Can public scientists do more to be transparent beyond requirements and what might that look like? And yes, I agree with what Sarah said. Cooperative extension needs to go where, where the people are and stop waiting for them to come into our office. It's such a good point. <laughs> We're very good at, at waiting around sometimes. And I was going to respond to Glenn in the chat, but I'll just, I'll just do it here. Um, I, I think that, um, you know, every, if you take a look at your, your Facebook feed, if you're on Facebook, you've probably, if you've been on Facebook for, for at least a couple years now, you have probably filtered 
out the information that you do not want to see on your feed. Um, you know, we self-select what we want to see by becoming friends with the people we want to be friends with, following the pages we want to follow. But then after a while, you start to even self-select more. And if friends or family are posting things that you just do not want to see, um, you can hide them from your feed. Mm -hmm. And so by doing this, we're, you know, curating this super focused um, view that agrees with our ideals and our morals and our values. Um, and by doing that, you're creating this, you know, bubble. So while social media has the potential to expand our minds and open up our minds and, um, and you know, um, culturally educate us, it can at the same time also make our bubbles so much smaller um, and keep us in that bubble. So it's, mm -hmm. yeah, it's really important to, um, yeah, to pay attention to, to all sides of the, the argument. And the best way to do that is to not be filtering our news feeds down so much, but that's what everyone else is doing. And that's what has led to, you know, all the controversy that we have over things that probably shouldn't be controversial. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Glenn mentioned too that the Facebook algorithm helps, at least Facebook specifically in my experience, they have a nice algorithm in place that helps feed that con confirmation bias even more. The more you like certain types of information or comment on certain types of information, Facebook is saying, you like to get this information, so we're going to feed you more of it. So even if you think that you're following pages and people who might be presenting alternative opinions and ideas, if you're not if you're not liking that, that information or sharing it or interacting with it in some way within Facebook, then you're just going to continue to get the information that you are interacting with. So Facebook helps feed that confirmation bias a lot. And you know, that then that's all you see and that's what confirmation bias is. And it's not always good. It's good to have that other side of the story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Sarah talked about Facebook deciding what your political views are and then using those to feed content and, and ads. That's so true. Facebook, <laughs> Facebook is kind of amazing because you can say one thing and all of a sudden it starts feeding you that information. Like you look at, you know, diapers on Amazon, all of a sudden you're getting tons of ads about babies on Facebook or, you know, you look for a wedding dress and all of a sudden it's wedding planning, wedding photographers, and <laughs> they do a really great job of um, those, those targeted ads. Oh, thanks for the link, Sarah. That's really interesting. I'll have to uh, I'll have to check that out for sure. Oh wow, yeah, for sure. <laughs> I'm gonna save that link. John was asking if there's a way to be more transparent about sources of funding. Oh, I'm gonna scroll back up. A lot going on in chat right now, which is a great thing. Um, for individual components of research. Aren't able to occur. Um, I mean, what do you mean by transparent, John? Can you explain that a little bit more? Like um, easier to share out, perhaps? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, I think maybe he means to like the, the transparency issue is so this research about Roundup says that it's perfectly safe, but who funded that research? Does it explicitly state in that? The research summary, I mean, people aren't going to go to that journal article and read it because most people might not be able to comprehend a lot of the, the verbiage or jargon in that paper. So where does it explicitly state, like, who's funding that? And when people find out that Monsanto funded it, they're like, oh, my gosh, it's inherently biased. My question is, who else is going to fund it? Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, yes, Monsanto definitely has a, a, a role to play, but oftentimes, in my opinion, too, that, you know, they have certain certain requirements through FDA and other federal organizations that they have to prove that this chemical is okay to, to put out in our farm fields. Um, where else is that money going to come from? If not from a large corporation who has it and who has, has to actually do that research or to prove that the chemical is, is safe. So it does seem like there's an inherent bias, but um, how do we, how do we be more transparent in that process and to let people know that, um, that this is just, it's almost a necessity for the, the work that we do. And yeah, Sarah said it, it best. If we're not willing to publicly fund our university and maybe raise people's taxes, then someone has to pay for the research. And you're right. 
Otherwise, there won't be any research. It needs to come from someplace. Trying to get back to the, the Twitter conversation, see if there's anything that we can chat about. Um, Shane brought up the point that scientists need to meet the public where they are. We've talked, you know, we've talked about that. We've talked about that on several EdTech LN uh, tweet ups, um, trying to get, you know, extension professionals uh, to use and engage with people where they are, so social media tools, um, and also just events that are already happening that we can tap into. Um, again, if you go to where the people are and you start forming those relationships that builds trust in them, they may actually start to believe what you're sharing with them, even if they don't initially agree with it. Yeah, um, yeah. That I was going to ask the same thing, Karen, if you had uh, tweeted that out. I wasn't sure if you were on Twitter, too, um, but it would be great to get that link out to, from your, uh, your case study example. Um, it would be great to get that link out to everyone on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And, and then that put it in the, uh, in the recap of the tweet up, too, and then even more folks will have access to it. John mentioned in the chat trying to describe our broad mix of funding sources that makes us more objective and do this more frequently than, than we currently do. That's a good idea, too. We don't have to talk about funding, I, I don't think, a lot, at least not on the, the public-facing side of things. Um, Kevin asked question number seven. We're kind of busting through these questions. This is great. Mm -hmm. He had a lot that he wanted to ask today. Mm -hmm. How do we better help the public understand funding? So that kind of leads us into the, the conversation that we were just having. Mm -hmm. What we really get, so how much money we get, how corporate uh, money affects decisions or not. That's a really tough question to answer. And you know, if, when I started an extension almost a decade ago, I don't know if this was necessarily that much of an issue back then. Um, but a couple years after I started, that's when the big push to go after alternative funding sources started. Um, so it was no longer okay to just sit around and wait and see if you got some grants through your um, university or um, maybe even through your extension org if there were some you know innovation grants coming up or anything along those lines. But then you had to start looking outside of your university for other sources of funding wherever you could get it to do some of the programming that you wanted to do. And so I think this is really becoming um, you know more and more of a of an issue for people um, because there may be. Even if it's just a small grant, there may be some some questions and things that come up based on who funded the work that you're doing. And we necessarily didn't have to worry about that in extension before. Yeah, Brad Anderson said on the tweet up when big ag is also a big funder for our research, our approach to controversial topics gets a lot dicier. And he's he's very right in that. Mm -hmm. Eric Staffney said $50,000 grant, while it might seem really big to the public, is what he calls small potatoes when it's dispersed. So when you get that $50,000 grant and it's dispersed among the, the people who were awarded money, um, it can seem like a, a really little amount of information. But to the, the public, they're not necessarily seeing that breakdown. They're seeing that a, a faculty member or a lab got $50,000 for a, a project, so it seems like a lot of money. Trying to get a tweet in here. I haven't tweeted hardly at all, <laughs> which feels very strange for me during a tweet up. Um, I'm not sure if it's been tweeted out yet, but I'll do it again if it has. Karen, I'm going to put your uh, put your example and your link in here. Somebody suggested to Kevin that we figure out how much 
how much corporations money actually spent on external research and they said it's probably smaller than than people would think that might be a good point too do we have even really a good sense of of how much people are spending how much corporations are spending towards university research i saw we were starting to trend earlier so now it looks like we have people trying to take advantage of <laughs> Our tech Alan hashtag. Yeah, they're probably not. That's not relevant. Yeah, the last time I thought we were trending and I saw that tweet, I I um I said something to someone and they said, oh, that's just a bot. So <laughs> I can't get too excited about it. <laughs> so we're still on question seven. Mm -hmm. This one, yeah, this one's tough. Um, you know, I'm not sure how we better help the public understand funding other than being transparent and trying to define what that means by being transparent and extension. And right, right, Jenny. And most most people aren't like John, and they're not going to dig into the research or into um, the faculty member or the person that did the research to see who funded it, um, and and then dig even further than that because it's not just enough to see who funded it. Um, so most people aren't going to take the time to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think that there and there's misunderstanding about university research at all levels. It's not just a funding issue, but most. I think that most people don't understand how research is even conducted from the, the, the in, like, okay, let's come up with the idea, like the conceptual phase to let's see this in practice, let's like replicate it, let's do it over and over. How many years can go into one research project to, to prove that one chemical is safe? Or I don't know, it, it's just hard because there's just a lot of misinformation at all levels of, of research. And, you know, whose responsibility is it? To, to help people understand if, if it's not going to be our responsibility, then who is going to take responsibility for it? You know, it almost has to be ours, but do we have the time? Do we have the, the money? Do we have, you know, for county offices, do we have our county um, political support to, to do that type of work, knowing that there are so many other community needs out there as well? But we also have to have support in academia and, and in research as a whole. Otherwise, people aren't going to come to us for information. So at some point, in my opinion, we have to start doing this. Otherwise, we're going to continue to lose. People are going to continue to lose faith in academia as a whole. And we can't let that happen because then it's going to be a free for all <laughs> of information. Oh, I'm glad Paul put that in the uh, in the question seven summary because I I missed that tweet. So figuring out how much money cor um, corporate how much corporate money is actually spent on external research is smaller than most people think. That's a great point. Okay, so question eight: How can we better use modern online tools to clarify controversial issues, maybe together and coordinate? So through some collaboration. Um, what, are there any online tools that you all on the webinar have been using to communicate, you know, on controversial issues or just doing your work in general? What would you define as a, a modern online tool that you're that you're using? Oh, that's a great question, Jenny. Um, well, if you're in the EdTech LN, there's a lot of collaboration going on. Um, outside of that, I'm not sure. Um, it's hard to collaborate across state lines because a lot of folks, if you're familiar, you're probably familiar with 4-H and everything. A lot of folks have a hard time even collaborating across county lines. It is getting better, but it's still difficult, and especially for certain program areas like 4-H. So, um, it's it's growing. Um, it's not necessarily at the point where I feel like it's a movement to start collaborating more across county and state lines, but it's definitely slowly, ever so slowly, moving in that direction. And um, you know, we have um, 
we have resources like the EdTech Learning Network and some other learning networks and communities that exist that are, are nationwide. It's just getting the word out and getting the right people involved to collaborate with those learning networks. That's, that's tough. Um, so one way that we've been able to grow the EdTech Learning Network is through our tweet ups and then um, trying to reach people at face-to-face -face events like our conferences that we have every year for different program areas, um, annual conferences in each state and other, other events. Um, and so just slowly through word of mouth and just showing up to things and having the tweet ups be a regular thing over the last two years, we've been able to grow the learning network. And that's one way to in increase collaboration because if you see someone on a tweet up twice a month and, and you get to talk to them about different things and you're both interested in the same thing, and you work similarly, then you're more likely to start working with that person on a regular basis. And we've had that happen. So um, it's just, uh, it's, it's really tough for people to help people connect the dots and get them out of their, their state bubble or even their county bubble. Mm -hmm. And a lot of that reason too comes down to, to funding issues. I mean, so many people, they're saying, well, I'm funded by my county commissioners. And because of that, I have to prove my local county impact. I'm not in it to teach the county next door the knowledge that I know. I'm certainly not in it to teach the state next door the knowledge that I know. And we need to find a way to allow, I think, our, our political figures to understand the importance of us coming together and sharing that knowledge and saying, okay, we have this huge pool of knowledge. Like when I was a county educator, one of my areas of expertise was invasive plants, which was super relevant to the county that I was in. It was also super relevant to the entire Midwest. So why shouldn't I have the opportunities to share that knowledge with the entire Midwest, but I have to stay right here in my county because that's, that's who's funding me. So we need to kind of break down some of those barriers too, but it, it, it's hard. And maybe those are conversations that we need to have more at the, you know, the political level in our states. Yeah, John, John was saying that most, or Jenny, sorry, Jenny was saying that most of the folks um, that she deals with in a, cooper, a cooperative extension are not tweet up folks. And you're exactly right. And that's why out of about roughly 15,000 um, program professionals and extension nationwide, we have about 250 to 300 EdTech LN members. Um, and it's, you know, it's because it is a, a smaller group. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's just, Tweet up wise, Twitter wise, um, we can pull more people in with webinars and other things like that, but getting everyone up to speed on um, tools that they should be using to reach people where they want to be reached is, is um, an uphill battle, but we're getting there. And I would think that, I wouldn't think that Maine is necessarily so different. I mean, we have, um, you know, I'm familiar with states like New Mexico where, you know, there are so, um, the extension professionals you know, where they're so spread out and they're often in places where there's not internet access or it's really difficult to have internet access. And so, you know, not necessarily, you know, trying to reach out to folks online and trying to do more online with social media and communicating and engaging with people that way isn't necessarily going to work for them. You know, they have to go to where their audience is and, and engage with them the way that they want to be engaged with and can be engaged with. Um, so it's not applicable to everyone. So that's a good point. I should probably tweet something out again. <laughs> what, what can I tweet? I know, conversation's sort of starting to come down a little bit. Yep, just a little bit. We're, we're almost at three o'clock. Um, I will put in a plug for um, the next uh, tweet up. Um, I believe, let me double check the, the topic here. I believe we have a topic for that one, but I could be wrong. Um, it's in two weeks. We, our, our tweet ups are always on the first and third Thursday of the month at two o'clock Eastern time. They're only an hour. Everyone says it's the fastest hour of their week. Um, so let me check this. Oh, okay. So, uh, Brad Anderson is going to be our guest host. Um, I'm not sure if he's chosen a topic yet, but, um, Brad is the leader of the nationwide 4-H film festival in Missouri. And he's a 4-H specialist, um, for Missouri extension. Um, and uh, he will do an awesome job. He's a lot of fun, and so I'm looking forward to that one. And that is on um, September 15th, Thursday, 
uh, from two o'clock to three o'clock, and that's our, our next one. Um, so for those of you that were on here that this was your first EdTechLN tweet up or your first Twitter chat ever, um, what did you think? Did you, did you enjoy it? Did you learn anything? Was it beneficial hopping on the webinar and doing both? Um, any last you know, parting thoughts on this topic before we hop off? Thanks, Karen. Yeah, and you know, Karen, even those of us on the EdTech LN feel like we're behind. So, um, you know, it's, it's always an uphill battle when it comes to technology and staying on the cutting edge. And it, it's always an eye opener to me anytime we have a call for innovative projects and I review um, the applications for those, it's always an eye opener to me to see what the varying um, definitions of innovative and high tech mean to different people across the system. Um, because it varies widely um, and it would be great to have a, a consensus on what innovation and high tech actually means and being cutting edge and what that looks like in extension. Jamie, did you get a chance to respond to Lindsay? I didn't hear, I was typing. Um, how do we get on the email list to find out about oh, future oh, um, Yeah, let me, let me put the link in for right here, just a second, I'm sorry about that, I didn't see it. Um, we do send out uh, email announcements. You can also um, follow the Facebook page, but of course not everyone that is a fan of the page is going to see everything we tweet at or post on Facebook. Um, we also have a, a blog that we post regularly too. I'll be um, getting the tweet up recap on this uh, blog soon. Uh, that'll be tomorrow morning. So there's our, our blog link and um, the info to join. Let's see if I can get it here. And this, this shows you like all the options for how you can follow, um, follow our posts and things that are happening. Um, I'll get it in the chat box here. And John, I'll get you the Facebook link. And if you are on Twitter regularly, um, Paul and I especially uh, tweet often and we'll tweet updates on events and other things that are coming up. We just had a Pokemon Go webinar last week that was a big hit. Um, and so if you follow us on Twitter, you'll get all that information too. And I'll put our Twitter handles in here or Danae can and then also um, follow the EdTechLN hashtag because we have a lot of folks that will um, uh, tweet out like questions and stuff. So if you, if you have a tech related question or any kind of question that you just want to post to the Learning Network, just tweet it out with the hashtag and I promise someone will get back to you. Um, we have a really great group of people that follow that hashtag and um, are willing to, to help when there's questions. Um, so let me post the Facebook link in here. I think someone asked for that. Did we, um, somebody just posted that somebody who just used our hashtag is one of the top harassers of plant scientists. So it looks like we may have just gotten our first troll. Yeah, we, we thought we might end up with a troll or two today, so. And I've heard him, his name before, but I, uh, Gary Ruskin. I am it. He posted a link to a bunch of articles. I. I don't know what they are, but let's check it out. Okay, yeah, you have to check it out. Food industry enlisted academics in GMO lobbying war, emails show. <laughs> yeah, so this is probably a lot of the stuff that Kevin has been fighting against. Well, yeah. there's Kevin's picture. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like we haven't really wrapped up, um, <laughs> Sarah said big enough to get a troll. Um, <laughs> We haven't really wrapped up the discussion yet. Um, Kevin did say something about um, if the conversation was going well, he wanted to keep it going a little bit. Um, so if folks need to hop off, that's fine. Or if you want to stick around, that's fine too. <laughs> and Kevin said, Gary, Ru Gary Ruskin chimes in with a great example of how Freedom of Information Act is used to cherry pick false stories to harm scientists. I think Gary, I don't know if Gary was one of the um, journalists that po uh, published some stories against him using some of those, those in, um, emails that came out after <laughs> Scott said, yeah, our first troll, <laughs> we rock. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know Gary, I, I've seen his, his stories before, I've at least seen his name come up in some of those narratives that have been created around Kevin and his work. Okay. So I'll be interested to, to see, um, I have not f followed Food Babe or tweeted at her. I know a lot of these people have, so they have um, 
she tends to block anybody with an, a dissenting opinion. So I have not done that because I always want to keep track of the, the type of stuff that she posts. So I wonder if she'll post anything about this, this tweet up um, and about how, you know, we're all Monsanto shills is what they like to say because we're talking about this, these topics. <laughs> it's a very interesting world out there once you start getting into stuff like this. And it's why it's so important for academics and extension professionals to be involved in these conversations. Surely we can't all be paid by Monsanto. (laughs) (laughs) See, this is getting good now, Kevin. So we could not have asked for a better person to chime in on this discussion with (laughs) Faith. Bravo. <laughs> I know, right? Jenny said, where's my popcorn? <laughs> I'm going to sit here and let this play out and see what happens. <laughs> Lindsay, if you haven't left yet, thank you so much for participating today. I just saw that you said you had to go a few minutes ago. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. It was fun having a lot of uh, new faces and new names um, on the tweet up today. We usually get a couple, but not this many at once. This was a great conversation. Yeah, I was hoping this would bring in a lot of new folks. And um, looks like we have a lot of, of new people who are familiar with Extension. We're always looking to you know, reach out to people who aren't familiar with the work that we do, too. Because, again, can't just keep being that best kept secret. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, John, for participating today. It was great to have you on today. Yeah, thanks, everyone. Looks like we're wrapping up. So um, if you have any parting thoughts, feel free to stick them in the chat box. Hopefully we'll see you on another EdTechLN tweet up in the future. Um, Be sure to follow the hashtag, um, like the Facebook page, get signed up for that email at listserv, and then you'll get all of our announcements for more events, webinars, professional development stuff we have going on and meetups at conferences too. That's another big thing that we do. Mm -hmm. So thanks guys. We really appreciate it. I had had a lot of fun talking with you today and meeting some new people. Yeah, this was great. And if you have colleagues that you think might be interested in getting involved with EdTech Allen, feel free to to forward the information on to them as well. Um, If they have uh, Twitter accounts, let them know um, to to follow along with that hashtag and, and get involved in whatever way they can. Thanks, everyone. Have a great holiday weekend. Thanks, Karen. I keep forgetting it's a holiday weekend. That's wonderful. It is. You don't work Monday. You said that. You, I was like, one on the weekend. webinar. Do not work Monday. <laughs> it is a holiday. <laughs> Thanks, Karen. We have fun multitasking. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah. Yeah, I'm trying to. Yeah, we're, we do our best. We do our best. We do track how many people we have on every tweet up and um, from how many states they came from. Paul has started doing that because he's a genius and he knows he needs to do that. So um, yeah, we try to grab what we can from the tweet ups. And it's, it's great to pull out um, with some free Twitter chat tools too, um, how many people we've reached because it's usually like hundreds of thousands of people just from one tweet up. It's pretty crazy. 20 bucks. All right. Yeah, there were a couple tools that we were going to sign up for too. Um, And I can't remember off the top of my head what they were because Paul was handling that, but um, I'll find out. And if there's any that you think we need to pay for and get like a pro account, let me know. Because we do plan to do that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thanks for joining us today. Hope to see you guys again. Danae, don't forget to stop the recording.